today a best-selling storyteller who turns the ordinary into incredible. Love Does author Bob Goff joins us live. Then, my son found her in the driveway. A traumatic brain injury. Her injuries were life-threatening. To their six-year-old daughter. Knowing that your baby's in that helicopter. One family in a fight for life. I just said, God, you can't take her yet. Please don't take her yet. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. President Trump is promising to be a strong defender of religious liberty. He says that our freedoms come from God, including freedom of religion and freedom of worship. The president is promising to make a change in the tax code that would allow churches to have more freedom of political speech. White House correspondent Jennifer Wishon brings us the story from Washington. I was sworn in on the very Bible from which my mother would teach us as young children. And that faith lives on in my heart every single day. Personal remarks from the nation's 45th president about his Christian faith. What I hear most often as I travel the country are five words that never, ever fail to touch my heart. That's, I am praying for you. He told thousands gathered for the annual National Prayer Breakfast that money isn't what defines success. So easily we forget this, that the quality of our lives is not defined by our material success, but by our spiritual success. I will tell you that, and I tell you that from somebody that has had material success. And he says Americans' freedoms come from God, not man. Among those freedoms is the right to worship according to our own beliefs. That is why I will get rid of and totally destroy the Johnson Amendment and allow our representatives of faith to speak freely and without fear of retribution. I will do that, remember. The Johnson Amendment is a tax regulation that prevents nonprofit organizations, including churches, from supporting or opposing political candidates of their choice. Many see it as limiting their free speech. President Trump renewed his promise to protect religious liberty both in America and abroad, a freedom he says is under threat now more than ever. My administration will do everything in its power to defend and protect religious liberty in our land. Some Americans see religious liberty as code for discrimination. Sure. Can you kind of give us a sense of how the president views this tension? We have freedom of religion in this country, and I think people should be able to practice their religion, express their religion, express areas of their faith without reprisal. And I think that pendulum sometimes swings the other way uh, in the name of political correctness. And I think the president and the vice president both understand that one of the things that makes our country and this democracy so great is our ability to express our religion, um, to believe in faith, to express it, and to live by it. And that's where I think the important part is, whether it's a small business owner or an employee who wants to have some degree of expression of faith at the company. And too often those voices get you know, pushed out in the name of political correctness. The text of a possible executive order on religious liberty was leaked before the prayer breakfast, but Spicer says there are no immediate plans for any such executive actions. We must never, ever stop asking God for the wisdom to serve the public according to his will. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. It's a remarkable change. Uh, the, what a difference a new administration is making. Just a few months ago, uh, the Presidential Commission on Civil Rights was singling out Christianity uh, for repression uh, in the name of civil rights and to have uh, it completely flipped to say, no, we respect matters of conscience. We, we, we want all Americans <laughs> to be able to worship, to express their views, uh, without any fear of reprisal. What a wonderful change. Well, in other news, the Trump administration is getting ready to put new sanctions on Iran. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? 
Thanks, Gordon. Those sanctions would be the first form of punishment since the Trump White House put Iran on notice after it test fired a ballistic missile Sunday. Mark Martin has a story. Repub Republican and Democratic senators have let the Trump administration know about their concerns about Iran. 20 senators said in a letter they want President Donald Trump to hold Iran accountable. The president says he agrees and is considering all options, including military action. Nothing is off the table. Right. The option front and center, though, is imposing new sanctions against Iran. The White House first sounded a warning earlier this week. As of today, we are officially putting Iran on notice. That after Iran test fired another ballistic missile and engaged in other provoking actions, which include approaching U.S. warships at high speeds. Iran continues to threaten U.S. friends and allies in the region. Iranian leaders responded by saying they do not have to get permission to defend themselves. And U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley this week called the missile launch absolutely unacceptable. What we are hearing from Iran is that they are being naive, saying we have no intention of attacking any country. I will tell the people across the world that is something we should be alarmed about. The United States is not naive. We are not going to stand by. You will see us call them out as we said we would, and you're also going to see us act accordingly. Mark Martin, CBN News. Thanks, Mark. Well, China is beginning its new year, and for the first time, the nation is embracing a new way to celebrate the holiday with a musical about the biblical story of Ruth performed across the Asian nation. As Gary Lane explains, Christian artists are hoping the play can deliver the message of Jesus to a new audience. This is a performance that has never been seen before in China. During the Chinese New Year holidays, theater goers are experiencing the biblical story of Ruth on national stages. Many have never heard of the story, which is centered on the true love relationship between Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. The show producers are hoping the play may improve family relationships. The only question I thought about the whole time was, how should we present this Christian story? I knew many broken Chinese families need to know the story. The conflicts among family members in China are greater than ever. This could be the chance to heal some of the broken relationships. I pray the spirit could make miracles. The sets and lighting design allow viewers to feel as if they were taken back to the biblical period. We invited historians from Israel to design the stage scenes along with the music with us. Hopefully, our audience is going to enjoy the time travel experience. Cast members are professional actors and actresses, a milestone in Chinese Christian theater history. Christian cast members told them about how Jesus changed their lives, and at least one actress accepted Christ. When I rehearsed the lines, I didn't quite understand Ruth's lesson about God until I became a Christian. For many Chinese Christians, being part of this play is also a way to rekindle a relationship with Jesus Christ. For so long, I haven't had time to read the Bible on my own. I used to make excuses to the Lord. While I was practicing the lines, I had the opportunity to read the Bible. I felt the Lord is inviting me to be united with Him again. This play challenged my walk with the Lord. Not only are the Christian artists in this musical hoping for a positive nationwide response, they're also praying the Chinese audience will develop an interest in knowing other biblical truths. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. Gordon, this is exciting to see. <laughs> it is, and that's a story you're not going to see on other news outlets, but we want to bring it to you to show you the good news is going around the world. Terry? Well, up next, he's the larger-than-life recovering lawyer, and he's got the secret to turning every day into an adventure. Bob Goff is here with us, and he joins us live right after this. Well, Bob Goff is an author, speaker, professional encourager. I mean, I've never heard that title before. And he wants to help you get back to building the rocket ship that was supposed to be your life. Take a look. Hey, I've never been on a submarine before, but I'd really like to, wouldn't you? Bob Goff calls himself a recovering lawyer because after 25 years, he left his law practice to become a full-time speaker and writer. 
Bob has inspired millions to dream big and make life more awesome. He's a popular speaker on college campuses and even sits down for the occasional interview, like this one with a second grader. There's a little country called Liechtenstein. You look it up on a map when you get home. Do they it, lick a lot of people? They don't lick people, it's licked and stunned. But that's awesome. They have a more sheep than people there. A few years ago, Bob wrote a book called Love Does, Discover a Secretly Incredible Life in an Ordinary World. He turned the proceeds from the book into an organization of the same name, which turns love into action, providing education and resources to children living in the world's conflict zones. Well, Bob joins us now. I've never heard anyone say that they were a professional encourager. That's a good, that's a great title. I love that. Oh, Gordon, thanks for letting me be here. Well, as a recovering lawyer to another recovering lawyer, what, what, what got you on the path to restore your sanity? You know the uh, idea that as lawyers we practice law, and, um, and there's something about, like, if you want to make a bunch of money, you could do that. But if you want to make a bunch of difference, sometimes you could, like, even keep your day job, but then find other things to do. And I just started thinking of those things in Matthew 25, hungry people, thirsty people, sick people, strange people, naked people, people in jail. And just like, what if we do that? Mm -hmm. And so we started off. Off arguing for a living? Yeah. And you know what? <laughs> like, while I uh, win arguments for a living, like, I just don't argue about Jesus with anybody. Mm. <clears throat> because uh, there's something just beautiful that happens, like humble voices carry further in the world. And, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's good to have a humble voice. I live on the bay with Sweet Maria, and, uh, and uh, people come by on their boats, and they talk about me. And it's so awkward, because they don't know I can hear yeah, them. Yeah, water carries them. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to think about is, like, how can we carry our voice in humble ways? You can speak things that are truth, huh. but like, there's that idea of just being a little bit more loving way to do it. Yeah. I've never argued anybody into heaven. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I don't raise my voice except when I'm yodeling, and I've never yodeled. <laughs> um, and so one of the, the ideas of writing this book, Love Does, was uh, there was a publisher, and they said, would you write a book? And I said, I don't know. Will you build a school? I'll trade you. One book for one school. And they said, tell me about this school. And I said, all right, 500 child soldiers in northern Uganda, mm. 50 teachers. They said, big school. I said, big book. <laughs> what, got, what got you to Uganda? You know, but there were some friends that were doing some work over there and they got into trouble. And so I went over to help out and I thought, well, like, gosh, well, you know, it's the same thing that everybody that's listening to you, probably what you've done in your life. You say, what are you good at? And I'm a pretty good lawyer. And so I went to the courthouse and I found the person that had the most guys with guns around his door. And it turns out it was the chief justice. And it started this friendship that's lasted many, many years. And the whole idea, mm. you start thinking together, like, how can we move the needle in somebody's life? And a lot of times, like when I finished up uh, writing this book, on the last page, there was a little bit of room. So I asked them, could I put my cell phone number in there? <laughs> they thought I was crazy. I'd gone around the bend. And I had, because this idea of following Jesus means a life of constant interruptions, right? And so what if we just make ourselves available to one another? The simplest thing. So mm -hmm. I still get 50 or 100 calls a day. It's crazy. I can't get a thing done. <laughs> I'm surprised to hear you say, you know, just talking together is going to lead to the solution. Because so often uh, when North Americans go overseas, it's we've got the plan, we've got the solution, we're, we're, we're going to show you how to do it. And you don't know, take that approach. Yeah, why, like, why is that? Sometimes when, well, it's bad advocacy. Right? Mm. Burning other people's opinions down doesn't make you like a right. It makes you an arsonist. What I'm trying to do mm. is do this. I try to like, I, mm. I have a strong belief in the word of God. I just, I read it. I know what it says. And when somebody says something that doesn't square with that, it's not that I'm passive. I just have so much confidence in the power of Christ in the world. I feel like, you don't have to swing at every pitch. And the power of loving people in just creative winsome ways. To say to people, well, let's just, what if we just go up there and do that together? So we're right now in Uganda, in Mogadishu, Somalia, in Iraq, in Nepal, and in India. And the next school will go in in Congo. Where, where did you start out? I started in India. Uh, well, where they what were, about that? Gotcha. Yeah, they were, uh, you know, buying and selling kids that were my daughter's age. Mm -hmm. I'm like, there, there's just no way I'm going to stand by and take notes. Um, so we just started participating. 
And that's for all of us. Like a movement is just a bunch of people making moves. And so you don't have to make all of them, but just make the first one. And then probably what you found is that that leads then to the next move. All of a sudden you're in Uganda. I said the courts in the northern part of the country hadn't been opened in 20 years because of the, the civil war that was happening. Took a couple friends and say, what if we go up there and open up the courts? And you know where it started? John Ashcroft. Mm. You know? He went over there. I called him up. I said, will you go with me? <laughs> He's like, who are you? I'm like, don't worry about it. So we went. <laughs> and there's something beautiful that just happens when you say yes. And, they, and it takes this mix of resolve and courage. And, and it's this whimsy. It's this yeah. thought. Going, what would happen if? And then just finish the sentence. And they, that's because you believe so much in God still being involved in the world and that he's going to make some stuff happen. If those wind is at your back, it'll yeah, come and together. He does it the same way. I mean, Jesus would just go up to people and say, well, follow me. Totally. And wouldn't tell them where we're going or, you know, how we're going to eat or where's the shelter or any of that. He just Bingo. said, follow me. Bingo. And it's up to us to say, okay. Yeah. And then you got to take the first step. Yeah. And then something happens and then you'll get interrupted, right? Somebody right. pulls on his shirt. He's like, who was that? Yeah. Little guy up in a sycamore tree. He's like, lunch on you. And so then what you do is you just take the next step and the next step. thing, And then you start seeing and you're guided by these mandates. Like when I meet Jesus... I think from what I'm reading, all he wants to talk about is hungry people, thirsty people, sick people, strange people, naked people, and people in jail. And I want to have something to talk about. <laughs> like literally, wouldn't it be awkward? Like if you just like, ran out of things and you had eternity left? So, and, and, and he doesn't want us to keep score. What he wants us to do is to keep our eyes fixed on him. And so you just do the next thing. And it's a, while it comes across as just winsome, it's actually very like purposeful, it's meaningful. Like we're in Mogadishu, Somalia, because they won't teach little girls how to read or write. I'm like, forget it, there's no way we're just watching. And it's a terrifying place to be. Um, but the thing is this, like I'm a comfortable guy and comfortable people don't need Jesus. Desperate people do and I'm trying to move from being comfortable to be more desperate and you get to uncomfortable and you could do that in your community. You don't well, have to go across. the gospel is supposed to disturb the uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I've spent my whole yeah. life, I realized, trying to make my faith easier. Uh, and I think what I'm learning now is he wants us to make it simpler, right? Jesus yeah. points to two sheep and he says, it's, it's like when one of those gets away. So what I'm trying to do is like, not make it super complicated, but just say like, what does it say? And then what's the simplest way to just get started? And it's always the next step. Well, let's talk about your book, Love, Love Does. How, how did you come up with the, just the title of it? You know, it was actually at a time where uh, a lot of people were really upset with one another. Uh, people in our family were acting like, you know, this family of God we've got here were acting like we weren't related. Yeah. And, uh, we and like so to fight. <laughs> that's why I put a bunch of balloons on the cover. I just want everybody to just take a breath. Right, I didn't put a bunch of Bible verses in there. Like, you want a Bible verse? Read the Bible, it's full of them. I just wanted to have a book that said what the Bible said. And so there's something beautiful about that. Wouldn't it be crazy if I said, I'm Bob Goff and I gave you my driver's license? And then I, I said, I live in San Diego, Sweet Maria, and I gave a utility bill. The, the, the proof of Jesus is in John 17, that we're one. Like, he just made it that simple. It ain't easy. But it's that simple. And so anytime I'm tempted, somebody says something that's just flat wrong and I'm tempted to be like the lawyer. Right? I want to make myself a sheriff and yeah. just be like, correct. And there's the right time for that. Uh, but there's a lot of wrong times. And what I'm learning is just like, just be a little bit more circumspect about this. James three to watch what your tongue says. And I'm just like, that's actually great advocacy. And to realize that it'll be the Holy Spirit that lets people know who Jesus is. It won't be Bob. I'm not trying to simplify it, but it's, it's almost like you, you say, love just goes and, and hangs out. And, and you, you just being with people is the most important thing you can do. Well, there's probably more to it than that, but it's, a, it's a informed by everything in your faith, right. super purposeful, but then what it, how it appears is that you're just hanging out. Right. But there's like, just like but this. you're bringing you're, you're bringing Christ. So totally. It's, 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 you totally you're you're bringing it. the Creator of the universe. Just with be you. one. So Just go when ahead. You, when you do that, it's transformative. Here's the deal. I want to love people who are easy to love. I mean, like 
like all the people I've met here. I mean, you're low hanging fruit. You're easy to love. Find people who creep you out a little bit. Yeah. And that's that idea of Matthew so five. Good. Be like, and I've spent my whole life uh-huh. avoiding the people Jesus spent his whole life engaging. And that's the, been the twist for me. Mm-hmm. I want to like find people that like give me the creeps a little bit and then just be friends with them. And, and that doesn't mean to like him, just to be with them, like Emmanuel, God with us, us with each other. Well, I find the amazing thing is you actually find community with them. Isn't that crazy? You, you find things you, in common. You find like... brotherhood and, and a connection that, you know, in the, in the natural you wouldn't expect. Yeah. But then just supernaturally happens. So you ask somebody, what's most important to you? And not have like a canned answer, but just like, what's most important to you? And uh, they'll say, oftentimes it'll be their families. I'm like, oh, you have one of those? Me too. And they say, well, you know, another thing is most important. They can say sports. And that's like zero for me. But like, sports, but like, tell me, I don't know anything about sports. Like, which one? And, and there's just something beautiful. You're not trying to work somebody or handle them mm-hmm. because we don't lead people to Jesus. Jesus leads people to Jesus. What we do is just love people. And they just, just witness. But it's an informed faith. It is just like, whatever. Like, you know, what's the most important thing to me? But I don't need to have a hoodie that says, what's the most important thing to me? John 17, just be one. That's the most important thing to Jesus. That where we would where, be where are you off to next? Let's see. Uh, the next uh, place we go is back to Uganda. We've got quite a few things going there. We have safe houses and uh, schools. And uh, then we're back in Somalia and Iraq. And um, we're thinking ahead to Pakistan. Um, so, so you're going to war zones? Hmm. Yeah, the, every uh, school is in a conflict zone. Yeah, because uncomfortable people like actually need Jesus. And, I, and I'm one of them. I'm not there uh, uh, to go as help as much as to participate and just do it. My worst subject in school was school. But it turns out <laughs> I'm like actually pretty good at starting them. So just do what you're good at. Like, that's it. Make your faith easier. Like, what are you good at? What did God me? If he made me good at the trombone, like I might play that every once in a while. But that actually might not move the needle as much as starting a school. But like do both. Like literally play trombone in your school if that's what you know how to do. And if we do that stuff, I think heaven will just be leaning over the rails saying like, bingo. Yeah. That's write, it. Write a song. <laughs> exactly. It and won't sell in Nashville, goes. but yeah. like. Let's see where it goes. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. Well, the book is called Love Does Discover a Secretly Incredible Life in an Ordinary World. And Bob, thanks for being with us. Thanks, thanks a million. For, thanks for encouraging us. Yeah. Yeah. God bless. Terry, over to you. Well, up next, one moment she was playing in a shed, and the next, she's being airlifted to a hospital and having part of her skull removed to save her life. She was laying there with every tube in the world hooked up to her. I just said, God, you can't take her yet. Please don't take her yet. Find out how this six-year-old survived when we come back. Well, after Reagan Bowman fell, she was taken on about a 60-mile journey to the nearest trauma hospital. Meanwhile, her parents knew their little girl was at the beginning of a very long road, and she was going to need prayer every step of the way. February 2nd, 2011 was an unusually calm day on the Bowman Farm in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. That changed soon after six-year-old Reagan got home from school. Like most days, she had gone out to play in the loft of a storage shed. Every day she went out there and played with her cats, and and she fell and hit her head on the concrete and crawled herself out. My son found her in the driveway, and then he picked her up and carried her to my husband. Her parents, Daryl and Tara, saw no signs of serious injury. She was crying, but she would not say anything. And she wasn't bleeding. There was nothing to indicate she was really hurt. To be safe, they called 911. They were stunned when the rescue squad told them she needed to be taken to a local hospital and then medevaced to the University of Virginia Trauma Center in nearby Charlottesville. And that was definitely a tough time, watching the helicopter go across the mountain into the horizon over to Charlottesville, knowing that your baby's in that helicopter. 
and you're not, you know. We had a lot of concerns. On the way to UVA, I uh, made like three phone calls to three preachers and kind of told them to pray for us. I really expected to take her over to UVA and be home in a day or two. At the hospital, they learned Reagan had suffered head trauma and was in critical condition. In addition to her severe brain injury, she also had a fracture of her lower left leg. And she had a fracture uh, of her right orbit, so around her right uh, eye. It was very severe. Her injuries were life-threatening. She could have died in the short term, in the acute process. She was laying there with every tube in the world hooked up to her. And they did drill into her skull to check the cranial pressure. Looking at your child lay there is definitely hard. It um, is very hard. You just couldn't believe it. I mean, you just, you know, you just kind of confused and didn't know what to think. The brain injury resulted in uh, swelling of her brain, which progressed rapidly over the first 48 hours. What would have eventually happened is her brain would have seeped out of her ears, and then she would have died. But I just said, God, you can't take her yet. Please don't take her yet. They actually eventually had to remove both of her frontal bones uh, in order to allow her brain to have room to swell so that further damage would not occur. The Bowmans reached out to their community for prayer. Kids went to the community Christian school. And the very next day after the accident, they all got around the gym and held hands in a big circle and prayed for. Friends came over and had prayer with us. She came through her surgery just fine, no complications, but we will not know any effects of her accident until she wakes up from her induced coma. Then the concern would be that she would have such severe long-term brain damage that she would end up with problems with walking, talking, thinking, eating, taking care of herself. Reagan was heavily sedated for three weeks. During that time, the brain swelling went down enough so doctors could replace the bones in her skull. Afterwards, she started physical therapy. Reagan had to relearn to brush her teeth and to walk again and make sure she didn't choke when she would swallow. So we had to teach her how to swallow again and to protect her airway. Every day you could tell that she was getting better. You couldn't keep her down before the accident. She was strong-willed. Then another problem developed. Once her skull was put back in, unfortunately she developed an infection at the site. And uh, she ended up having to be on several courses of antibiotics to treat that. She ended up having to have the fluid drained out of that area. The Bowmans continued to pray for their little girl's healing. And every night, we prayed over her. And we surrounded the room with, with Christian music and prayers and scripture and spoke the word out loud. Reagan's infection cleared up quickly, and she continued her therapy. She ended up spending less time in rehabilitation than we thought she was going to need to spend in rehabilitation. Her progress was very rapid, more rapid than we typically see with children who have this degree of severity of a brain injury. It was 56 days after the accident, eight weeks, <laughs> that we got to come home on March the 30th. And God didn't leave anything unhealed. Everything was healed completely. That was 2011. Today, as Reagan moves into her teen years, she still shows no sign of long-term effects. I feel perfectly fine. I feel I can do anything. <laughs> We typically would see uh, significant long-term problems with attention, with impulse control problems, language problems. Uh, when you look at the areas of her brain that were injured, and again, it's quite remarkable that uh, she isn't manifesting those difficulties. To finally bring Reagan home and have her walk through the house was just an enormous, happy feeling. Just thank you, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you for letting her walk through that door. I know that God answers prayers because I'm living proof of that. Prayer does work, and the power of prayer was there and healed her completely. God is the great physician. Wow, 
Wow, what an amazing story. You know, life happens all around us and it happens very unexpectedly often. Prayer changes things and that's why right now we want to encourage your faith with some other stories of people whose lives have been touched by the power of God before we pray for you. you all right, one. here's Daisy from Troy, Ohio. She twisted her hip on working at her job. She received medical treatment, but it was very painful and it made the injury worse. Mm -hmm. So she stopped going and decided to ask the Lord to heal her. Don't recommend you do that, but <laughs> <laughs> doctors are good. One night, Daisy was watching TV when she says the Holy Spirit told her to change the channel. She found the 700 Club just as the hosts were praying. And Terry said, you have a problem with your hip. God's healing you now. Well, Daisy stood up and the pain was gone. She even went shopping the same day. Wow, there's a healed woman. <laughs> <laughs> Without any trouble. Just saying. That is, <laughs> yeah, you know it's a miracle when you can go shopping again. That's wonderful. Well, I want to tell you about Kathy. She's 83 years young. She's from Mustang, Oklahoma. She fell and strained her right shoulder. She couldn't lift things, couldn't sleep well for months because the pain was so bad. One day while watching this program, Gordon, you had this word. You said, you have an extraordinarily painful shoulder. You're in agony. God is healing you. Kathy claimed the word. Immediately she began to feel better. She was able to lift things again and is now sleeping through the night. How wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, let's pray for you. And here's a thought for you. It's from the Bible. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means Jesus is in the here and now. And what he did 2,000 years ago, he is still doing today. All we have to do is believe it, to, to, to appropriate it, to rely on it, to trust on it. He told us to announce to people the kingdom of God is at hand. All you have to do is reach up and get it. And how do you reach up? You reach up with faith to say, Jesus, I trust you. I trust in your unfailing love. Let him be the God in the now, just as he was for that family. Here, their little girl airlifted away. They're not even able to be with her. The only thing they can do is pray, but it's also the best thing they can do. So we're going to pray for you and the God in the here and now, the God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever is going to show up for you, show up to your need right now. Let's pray. Jesus, we just come to you and we come boldly because we know that you have grace, you have mercy, you have love, and you have healing. And so, Lord, right now, just stretch forth your hand as people are reaching up to you. The kingdom of heaven is at hand and they're reaching up to you. We just join with them for whatever they're praying for. We come into agreement and we say, be healed in Jesus name, be restored. We bind all spirits of infirmity now in the name of Jesus. And we say, good, be gone and never return. And we speak specifically to brain functions mm -hmm. that they would be healed, that Alzheimer's would leave, that brain trauma would leave in the name of Jesus. What doctors have declared dead, we speak life to those neurons now. Let them fire off normally in the name of Jesus. Be healed and be made whole. There's a woman, your name is Miranda. You're in the hospital. You have swelling on your brain. You saw that story and you're saying, please say that. And so I'm saying it just for you, for your family, for everyone listening right now, Miranda, be healed now. And may that swelling be gone and all pain leave and all brain function be normal now in the name of Jesus. Terry? There's someone else, you've just gone in for an eye exam and um, I mean, you went in for what you thought was just a routine exam and you've been diagnosed with some eye condition. 
God's healing you of that right now. Just receive it. Your sight will be fine in Jesus' name. Well, someone, you have a degenerative condition of the spine, and it's like your, your bones are, are leaching away, and, and God is just healing and restoring bone, restoring movement. Uh, you're now going to find that you're limber again. You can stand up straight again. Just, just receive it now. What you couldn't do before, do now in the name of Jesus. And there's someone else. I don't think it's the same person. You, for reasons with your spine and your hips, you're out of alignment and it's affected your gait. That means it's affected your hip and your knee. God is just restoring that to you right now. Just stand up and stretch your body as tall as you can and just receive complete alignment from the power of God. And some of the numbness tingling in your left leg, I think it's related to um, diabetes. God's healing that right now. He's able to restore nerves. He's able to restore. So may the God of all restoration come to you right now. And what doctors say is impossible is possible with God. We just speak healing all the way down into your feet. Thank you. All that swelling, all that discomfort now in Jesus' name be gone from you. And we speak to your sugar, insulin, all of those levels be healed, be restored, be made whole in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the wonderful miracles you perform. And we just just praise what you have done, for by your stripes we are healed. We receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. If you have had a miracle, we want to hear it. We want to hear your story. So testify to it. Give witness. 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, it's our honor, our privilege to pray with you, to pray for you. We're here for you 24 hours a day. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead. She's a young girl who knew the stories of the Bible even before she ever set foot in a church. See where she got her knowledge and how your children can as well. That's next. Welcome back to the 700 Club. A man suspected of murdering a Denver security officer is said to have been an Islamic extremist. 37-year-old Joshua Cummings is accused of shooting a security officer in cold blood Tuesday night. Cummings is in court today. Local Muslims say he was radicalized soon after converting to Islam. Members of his mosque even warned police that an attack might be brewing. Operation Blessing is still helping people in Albany, Georgia, recover from a devastating tornado nearly two weeks ago. The team was able to help one resident, Mr. Eddie, who lives with his 84-year-old mother and is raising his nine-month-old granddaughter. He said the tornado came unexpectedly and that he is truly thankful Jesus spared their lives. He said, I know the Lord protected us and he led us where to go. Operation Blessing spent Wednesday afternoon helping him move his furniture out of his home and continued to help him on Thursday, clearing more debris. And you can find out more about what Operation Blessing is doing in Albany and how you can help by going to their website at ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, 10-year-old Lainey knows a lot about the Bible, and yet until recently, she had never been to church. For the last year, Lainey has been learning about God all by herself, thanks to CBN's Superbook. Meet Lainey. She's a 10-year-old aspiring artist. I love to draw horses, emojis, people. One of Lainey's favorite people is her 80-year-old neighbor, Skip, who's nearly blind. They have a very special friendship that began with their mutual love for animals. Nothing I wouldn't do for that kid, and I told her mother and dad, I said, you don't have to worry over here because anybody bother her, I'd die for her. Skip also wanted his young friend to know about Jesus, the man who did die for her. He knew Lainey's parents didn't go to church, so he invited her to go with him. In Sunday school class that day, Lainey and the other children 
watched an episode of Superbook. Pastor Kelly Westmark noticed that Lainey had a lot of answers for a girl who had rarely been to church. And I said, Lainey, how many times have you been to church? And she said, well, this is my second time. And I said, well, I, I don't understand. How do you know about this? And she said, well, I learned it all on the Superbook app. I was shocked to find out how much she knew about the Bible. She knows more about it than I do. Lainey explained that a year before, a classmate showed her the free Superbook app. She downloaded it onto her own tablet and started learning Bible stories and playing Superbook games. Then she responded to an invitation she saw on the app. It says, are you ready to accept God? I said yes, and then told me a prayer to say, and I told that prayer, and ever since then, God's always been in my heart. Lainey looks forward to going to church with Skip every week and learning more from Superbook. Her favorite characters are Gizmo and Joy. You wouldn't expect a lady to be strong, but she would be really strong in it, mostly a lot of things. Kelly says the messages and strong role models found in Superbook will make a big difference in Lainey's life and in the lives of other children who need guidance and hope. We're trying to break through that and just asking God, God, please bring your love and your light and your hope, you know, to these little kids. And God did that for Lainey. Lainey was recently baptized. Now she tells everyone, including her parents, about Superbook and Jesus. I tell my mom and dad that it's really fun and it's really good for me to learn about God. And I'm so thankful for the Superbook app. She would not have known the Lord without Superbook. I think it's the best thing could happen to her. You can be a part of it. You can be a part of supporting Superbook. We're on our way to 50 languages. We're broadcasting so that child the children of the world can hear and see the stories of the Bible. And there's the broadcast map for you. Huge audiences in the Philippines, Indonesia, India. Uh, we're launching throughout Africa, Latin America. You can be a part of taking the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. How do you do it? You join the Superbook DVD Club. And your gift of $25 or more goes into the production costs, the translation costs, the distribution costs, what it costs to do that wonderful free Superbook app. You're a part of all of it when you join the club. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Now coming up, a narc gets an offer he couldn't refuse. And of course the guy wants me to use methamphetamine to prove that I'm not a cop. I remember doing a line of meth and um, having this moment where I was like, oh, this is not good. And it only got worse. Find out what happened when we come back. Well, Joe McElroy says he was like a kid in a candy shop. He was a crooked cop who got put in charge of the evidence room, where he had practically unlimited access to stolen coke. Soon, Joe was on the other side of the law and wound up in the same place as the people he tried to bust. Everything in my life was focused on having a whole lot of people accept me. And my actions had brought me to a point where I was getting recognized, but I was getting recognized for the ugliest, most, um, most hated things you can do. My name is Joe McElroy. In my four years as a narcotics detective, I took down some pretty bad guys. Eventually, I became one myself. My story starts when I was just a kid growing up in Arkansas. The relationship with my father was difficult. Um, he, he worked a lot, he expected a lot, and um, I always felt like I didn't quite, didn't quite make it to that standard that, that he had set for me. I knew he loved me, but I, I don't feel like I ever gained that ex the, the acceptance. So when I got to high school, I discovered ways to get people's attention. I found that when I drank and when I got loud and showed off or fought or whatever it was, um, people would look at me and smile and laugh and thought I was funny or crazy or whatever you wanted to call it. I could go to these parties and be accepted by you know, a lot of people. By the time I got to college, the partying had pretty much taken over my life. 
I was drinking at least a 12 pack of beer a day and, um, and smoking weed pretty much every day, all the time. I dropped out in my first year, got a job working at a warehouse. Later, I got married, I started a family, but I felt like a failure and I wanted to prove myself. That's when I decided to become a cop. To be able to go around with the, you know, with the badge and the uniform and the, um, it gives you a sense of power. It all fed into this need for um, acceptance and for being, being known for something. So I stopped smoking weed, cut back on the drinking, and I made it through the academy. But being a cop, it was never enough. So I worked my way up to becoming a narcotics detective. That's when the trouble started. I was working undercover, posing as a potential buyer. So I go to buy a, a substantial amount of methamphetamine. And of course the guy wants me to use methamphetamine to, to prove that I'm not a cop. Hey, you like that stuff? Yeah, that was good stuff. I didn't want him to shoot me. Yeah. And I wanted to do the cases. I wanted to make the cases. I remember doing a line of meth and um, having this moment where I was like, oh, this is not good. Uh, something's different about this. Something's dangerous about this. It wasn't an if I'm gonna get high again at that point, it was when am I gonna get high? How am I gonna get high? What do I have to do to get high? What do I have to steal to get high? I got my answer when I was assigned to clean out an old evidence room. There were drugs, weapons, money, you name it. It was all too easy to take what I needed to support my addiction. My family didn't matter. My career didn't matter. My image didn't even matter anymore. Addiction had taken over enough at that point that it, it was in control. It ran my, absolutely 100% ran my life. Eventually I got caught and was arrested on nine felonies. I was facing like 120 years. If they'd have really wanted to stack those charges, I was devastated. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even know where to begin or what to do with myself. Since I didn't have any priors, the judge only gave me one year of jail time with 10 years of probation. So here I am, dirty cop, walking into prison, my story's on TV. They're looking at the TV. They're looking at me. My first several days there was, it was fighting. Um, it was really getting beat up. One day I knocked over a stack of food trays just to get put into solitary confinement for protection. My heart was as soft as it could be at that point. Um, I had taken physical beating, mental beating, spiritual beating. I was done. I knew I needed to change. I knew I needed something other than what I'd been seeking this entire time. And the only person I knew to, to ask for help from was God at that point and invited him to, to come work in me. Jesus, forgive me, please forgive me. For the first time in my life, I felt like I'm accepted, I'm okay, I'm good enough because he's so good, because he's so um, loving because he's so kind. After that, I got myself transferred into a faith-based block to serve the rest of my sentence. There, the Christian inmates showed me God's love in such a real way. It was the first time that I'd ever laid, laid myself bare and been transparent with, with people. I could just be me, and they accepted me and they loved me with all my flaws and all my mistakes. I got out in 2010, and over time, God has helped me overcome my addiction and get through a painful divorce. Now I'm happily remarried and working at a contracting company. God's acceptance is without, um, without hindrance. You don't have to perform to receive it. He's there, he's ready. He's that, um, that dad that's running towards you, not, um, not holding back at all. Joe is so right. God's acceptance is without judgment for what we've done or where we've been. Even though we're created in the image and likeness of God, and even though heaven is the place that we're headed, we do things. We make choices. We get ourselves in binds that sometimes control us, change who we are, just smudge the image that God's made in us of who He is. And yet, He's a dad who comes after us. What I love about Joe's story is 
He didn't wait for Joe to have some great revelation. He didn't wait for him to clean up his life and get everything straight. You know where he went? Right into the mess, right into the very cell that Joe was sitting in. And he met him there. He invited him back to the right path, back to fatherhood and sonship without a record, without a history. The Bible says when God forgives our sin, he forgives it as far as the east is from the west and remembers it no more. You can't go far enough to get away from the love of God. Let today be the day that you do business with God. Just all you have to do is come face to face with him and say, God, you know me. You already know what I've done, but now I recognize it. And I'm coming you to you today confessing my sin, confessing my rebellion, confessing my unwillingness to receive who you are and what you've created me to be. But I come to you today asking for a fresh beginning, asking Jesus for you to come into my heart and my life. Forgive my sin as far as the east is from the west. Give me a new beginning filled with your Holy Spirit. That's all that I need is more of you, God. Ask it in Jesus' name. He's a good, good Father, and he loves you more than you can know. If you pray that prayer, we'd like to send you the New Day Packet to help you grow in your faith. It's free. Just call and ask for it. If you'd like to pray with someone more specifically, you can do that on our toll-free number as well. It's 1-800-700-7000. There's a friend on the other end of that line. Don't miss out on what God has purposed for your life. We want to leave you today with these words from Psalm 34. It's verse 8. Verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Take refuge in the Lord your God today. You were created in his image and likeness with a purpose headed for an eternity that's been planned for you. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again Monday on The 700 Club.